We are in a short series, and my time is ticking away, and a short series on engaging in church. So today, it's a little more practical than it is theological, but it's the, the practical outworking of what this looks like. And for some, this may seem like a little bit of repeat, but I think in Canada, we kind of, um, maybe not just Canada, maybe as creatures of habit, we kind of go down a road and we just kind of keep doing the same thing week in, week out, and without like maybe we just kind of do church and then we forget to come back here and say like, God, like what did you intend or what are we lacking or what needs to be adjusted? And so we're in that stage. And again, culture also impacts what like a gathering looks like, how a church functions. So for instance, you'll notice that we had a coffee break. Yeah? Why in the world do we do a coffee break? Because the Bible clearly does not say, it's close, Hebrews, that's about as far as we get. Yeah, okay, okay. But otherwise, it doesn't say that you should have coffee break at the church service, but we started a coffee break like eight plus years ago. And the reason is because we felt like there was a cultural struggle, a, a, an anchor point church cultural struggle. And the cultural struggle was, or not maybe cultural, but the struggle that we saw scripturally that we didn't, couldn't pin here was like unity, loving each other, being together. And so if we just had a service that would go on, People would come in, sit, lovely rows, and then church is done, and anyone who was like afraid of being caught got out the door fast, right? Like you could just, whoo. So all of my introverts, give me a shout out. Oh, what? I got a shout from introverts, that's good. And so we thought, if we do a coffee break, if we do a coffee break in the middle, then we stay and we have the chance to meet people and say hello and interact and talk and run into each other and... We had two bathroom stalls in the basement when we started, and there was long lineups for the bathroom. So that's why we did a coffee shop, I mean a coffee break in the middle of service. As an example, it doesn't say in the Bible, but it's a thing that we saw that we needed to work towards. One of the things that we hear all the time is we come to the church and people like really want to know you. We, we find people right away. We get to connect with people. Not always, but it seems like the culture has shifted quite a bit in this area. We also do journey one and journey two for this reason. We want to work on building relationships and having them go deep and getting people to know each other and learning how to minister to each other. And these are values that we seem to find it hard in an individualistic society to get these things going. Back in the Bible time, it was like you lived in a community, you went to the market together, you were all within the same region, and you would go to church together, so, or you would gather together as believers. So today, we have to do a little bit more creativity to make that happen. Sound good? Yeah? I just need to know you're with me, so you can, you can talk today. Okay, you guys can't. I just need this side before the roof falls. Okay. So today, uh, again, some of the other adjustments are... We're starting missions. This is a, a part that we didn't see before. We knew that there was something there, but we just didn't know for sure. And you'd, it's hard to just put someone in charge of missions if there isn't a calling to be in it. So now there's a call and we believe it's the right time. And so again, this is some of the things that we're doing. So the analogy that I often use with, with the staff, and it's, it's, it's an old analogy, is if you imagine a wine barrel, and a wine barrel has wooden staves on the wine barrel. And the question is, how much wine can a barrel hold? Well, you can only hold as much wine as the lowest stave in the barrel, right? So if you have all perfect staves, but one is removed, the wine barrel is useless. It doesn't hold anything, right? If you have it in there, one stave is like cut off halfway, you can have wine up to that amount. So consistently what we do in the church is we're always looking around this barrel or the life of the church and saying, God, where's an area we need to shore up? What's What's the next stage? Because again, like there's always, there's always things that need to be changed and we're working towards that end. But what's the lowest one right now? What do we need to, what do we need to raise up right now? And so hence why we're gonna have this conversation or this message today. There's some things that we're going to make some adjustments on um, as we're moving forward starting in October. So let me pray. God, it is good to be together today. It is good to put our attention upon you. It is good to be pushed out of our comfort zone and it's good to learn about you and to grow and to know you. It is good. It is good to bring believers together. It is good for us to learn unity together. 
It is good for us to dig in the word. It is good, God, for us to challenge each other in our walks with you. It is good. Jesus, thank you that you left and you sent the Holy Spirit to come. You can work in each of our lives all the time. That is good. And God, for that, we praise you. Thank you for this morning. Help us, God, in these next 20 some minutes. God, would you help us to like capture where we believe you're leading us as a church, would you help us capture it, God, that it's not a nice idea that we see the value in it. So thank you, God, for this time. Amen. So, there's a scripture that says this in John 14, uh, verse 23. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey obey what? Obey his teachings. This is one of those verses that is really tough for me. It's like, I want to obey him. I say that I obey him. I try to obey him. But if I love him, then I obey him, which means if I don't obey him, I'm not in love with him. You follow? So if you don't obey, you're not in love. So it goes on to say, my father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I've spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Sometimes I wonder if we are falling close or if we sometimes fall close to the not obeying so therefore not in love with. And boy, as a pastor, for myself personally and for the church, I so desperately want it to be the other way where I love you so much, Jesus, and I obey you. So I was thinking about obedience a lot. So obedience is interesting. As a parent, I have four children. Michaela, my oldest, is getting married next week, so then she's not my responsibility anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but what is obedience? I grew up in the era where we did the uh, one, two, three method of parenting. Are you guys familiar? Hey, go clean up your toys. Hey, don't make me count to three. That's one. That's two. Right? And then we, at three, we walk over and we grab the child like this where they're doing the chicken wing and they obey what mom and dad say. Any of you grew up that way? Okay, so it's like, ah, okay, 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 okay. And you obey that way. Is that obedience? Or is that like forced cohesion? It's like, ah, <laughs> And a child doesn't know necessarily why to obey. Parents says, hey, I need you to clean up your toys, wash your hands, and then come sit down because we're going to have dinner. And they go, okay, dad. And then they do nothing. Is that obedience? No, it's not obedience. Now, we decided that we wanted our children to learn on like, to, to answer on, on the first call, not on the third call. And it's just better if I say, hey, can you clean up the toys, wash your hands, and come to the table? And then right now, they listen. This is As parents, we just thought, well, you could teach on the first or the third, and we wanted to teach on the first. The difference between parenting and Jesus is Jesus typically doesn't come over, grab you by the arm, and drag you to make you do. Sometimes he's pretty strong at it. But a lot of times he doesn't do this. He's like, will you obey me? And if you love me, you're going to obey me. And I remember when our children, as they grew up, they would all of a sudden start to obey things and, and obey what we're asking And I would say it's just like a natural response to the love that they have. It's like their stubbornness is being laid down, their selfishness, and they begin to trust mom and dad that they know better than what they know. Now, not always. Um, Once again, (laughs) Michaela will get married and then it's not my problem anymore. (laughs) I love you. (laughs) I got to roast all I can right now. This is my, my one chance. But obedience, once the child can trust that the parent is like, has their best interest, truly loves them, and they, they know things perhaps that the child doesn't know, like your hands are filthy because you put your fingers in places that only children do. You should go wash your hands. This is good. Why clean up the toys? Well, if you don't clean up the toys and you leave it for a week, even if you leave it for four hours as a, with a child, the whole house becomes a disaster and no one wants to be in the home. Come and sit down because you need to eat, and if you learn to eat regularly and good nutritious food, it's good for you and it's good for a family to sit together. But a child doesn't know those things, so a child learns to obey their mom and dad, and the children are supposed to come underneath that leadership. But as adults, we're supposed to obey him if we love him, 
And this is a really important thing because he knows better. He, he knows the future. He knows the past. He knows the billions of people that are on earth. He knows what always has been. He knows where there's needs in the world. He knows where he needs to send people and why. He knows your shortcomings, your failures, your gifts, the ones he's given you, what he's asked you to do, what he hopes that you do, what he's going to strongly encourage you to do. He knows all of it, and his heart is always good to you. It's always right towards you. It's good towards you. He loves you, and it's perfect, and it's pure. But if we don't trust that he knows, if we don't trust these things about him, then actually what happens is we don't realize that we've just left the, the floor a disaster, that our hands are filthy or there's like sin in our lives that are keeping us from him, and we don't actually step into what he's asking us to step into. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, is what he says. What type of obedience do you think God wants? Third call, 10th call, 100th call, first call. Why? It's important. It's actually, maybe I think this is right, it's more obedient. Right? Like it gets tiring to ask someone to do things over and over and over. And I think the Lord just sometimes just says, you know what? I'll just move on to somebody else who will say, yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll move to somebody else. So what keeps us from obedience? What keeps us from it? I think sometimes fear, right? It's just crippling. You can't see, you're like, God, I can't do it. Maybe not having the knowledge of who God is, right? So it's not just fear, it's like, oh no, you're gonna ask me to do something I don't wanna do. This is gonna be dangerous, I can't. God, if you knew, I this. It's like, oh, child, I know. Actually, if you knew what I knew, you would say yes immediately because my plan is so good. There's a mission I have, but so often we just, we just don't, right? Like so often we stay there. So I think that, I think selfishness, it's like, God, I want to do this. God, I don't want to give this away. I, I want to travel. I want to go like this. God, don't you see? I love these things. Like, you made me to love everything. Like, why are you asking? He's like, my child, if you love me, obey me. Because my way is better. My way is actually the, not just better. It's the best way in which you can live. There's a couple of scriptures that are kind of have become pivotal for us as a church, I'll say. And it's these scriptures that I keep coming back to to say, okay, there's adjustments that we need to make in our church for us to fulfill scripture better or to raise some of the staves a little bit higher in here. So the first one is what I spoke on a couple weeks ago, unity. How important is unity to Jesus? On a scale of one to like really important, where would you put it? Really. <laughs> oh yeah, well, it's pretty really important. In fact, it's it's the most important, at least in his prayer, when he's talking to the Father. And I'm just going to read it because it's, it's really valuable. My prayer is not for them alone in John 17. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That's the oneness that he wants. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the reason why he wants unity, that the world would know. And he repeats it too. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That is a remarkable thought. But if we actually don't believe that to love God is to obey him, we read this and go, that's cool. That's, that's neat, right? But that's actually not the point here. The point is like, God, where are we disunified? God, where do we need to work? Like, what is, where are there areas that are wrong? Because it doesn't just impact you. It actually impacts the world, people to come in and to see that he came from heaven to die so that we could be one with him, walk with him, live with him, to spend eternity with him one day. So unity is a big part of why we're gonna make some adjustments at the church. Ephesians 4 is probably like our, our life chapter or life part of, our, of the church here. So Christ himself, that's Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all, here it is again, reach unity in the faith. This is it's like, what is that? Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, 
attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. His goal is unity that is so close, our knowledge and love with him that is so close that actually we grow into the whole measure of Christ, the fullness of him. We are the bride and the body of Christ. We're to grow in the fullness of who he is. That's profound. So he speaks of unity, knowledge, becoming mature, becoming like Christ. This is one of the reasons or a scripture on why we're going to make some adjustments to attempt to walk this out with increased clarity or with increased purpose. 1 Corinthians 14, this one is important and tough. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. We don't do this very well. We eagerly desire gifts and we talk about it sometimes, but do we corporately say like eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy? It's like, what is that? Some of you are like, prophecy? I'm out. No, no, no. It says in scripture that we are. For anyone who speaks in, in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. It's like, how are we going to do that? How do we find increased ways? We, we're working on it. We're trying to become more mature. We have a prophetic course that we go through, and we have opportunities for people to come for prayer. But we want to find ways in which the gifts can be used because it's really hard to say that we're to eagerly desire the gifts and then never use the gifts of the Spirit, right? Like this would be, this would be a challenge. Um, in uh, Pastors and Leaders Prayer Network, once a month, the pastors and leaders in the city, we all get together for a time of worship and, and prayer. And uh, we got together two weeks ago. And while we were there, I just invited everyone. I said, you can come up front and we're just going to worship God in unity together and and then if you want prayer, I just invite you to kneel down, and when you kneel, uh, come, and someone will come and pray for you. So we were up there, and we're worshiping together, and I just went, and I knelt down, and I was wrestling through something. I was wrestling, actually, for you. I was wrestling for the church. And I'm like, God, I know that we're to train up and send people. God, I'm wrestling with this idea of, like, how do people sense their call? How do I know when they're mature? How do we know when to send them? I'm like, God, like, I was feeling, like, sort of inadequate, even though God has spoken so many times on what my job is and what I'm supposed to commit myself to. And I'm like, God, I just, I just don't know. And I was hoping inside that God would send someone to come and just minister to me to unify us by faith. And what happened? A guy that I barely know, he walked over like maybe five minutes of, of me just sitting there praying or kneeling, and he put his hand on me and he spoke, not knowing what I needed, he spoke right into my heart. And he said, I'm just going to write it here, Donovan, God is saying that he has anointed you. And the time is now. Whatever it is, the time is now. It's not time to wait. You have everything that you need. The gift is all there. Now is the time and the anointing is upon you. Now, if I would say that to myself, right? If I'm like, hear from God, I'm like, yes, I got the anointing. Woo! Right? Like, Yeah! That's weird, right? That's weird. You'd be like, ah, child. But when, when you're wrestling and you're like, God, I don't, I don't think I have it. I'm not sure what to do. I'm feeling insecure. I'm fearful. And someone comes and ministers the spirit of God upon your life. It's so profound. And coming out of it, I was like, God, everyone needs this. Everyone needs the opportunity to be ministered to, to have a prophetic word of encouragement or built up something that's going to pour into you to encourage the believers. And who knows if some of you are going to have a time where someone will come and lay hands on and sense a calling on your life. And they'll say, man, I'm not quite sure, but I think the Lord might be saying like Europe, that you're going to be sent to Europe. And I think you're going to learn Dutch. And they just don't know why they have this sense. They pray something and they walk away and the Holy Spirit uses this to draw someone, to move someone towards his kingdom and towards a call. We're going to make some adjustments in our church because we think that this is really important to practice more, to use more. Later on in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, verse 26, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. We see this as valuable. This is like maybe what small groups are to look like, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. But perhaps there's room within our services as well that we can have a revelation or a hymn or God shows us something. And we've started to do some of that. But 
this is another reason why. And finally, our worship and our love for our King, Jesus. There's lots in Scripture that speaks about worship, and Abby did an amazing job. You can go back and listen to it on worship a few months back. And but we want to be people that don't just kind of like nick heaven in our worship. You know, where we just like, ah, ah, cool. Yeah, I kind of ooh, just touched it. No, we want to go. We're invited to come right into the throne room and sit before God. We get to sit, he invites us to be raised up into the heavenly places and engage with him. But I fear, again, that what happens is we we fill our lives with so many things and we're distracted by so many things that we barely make a moment of time to get into his presence. And then we come here and we just kind of nick heaven and then we break for coffee or we nick heaven and then we this and, and we want to make some adjustments so that we are brought into the throne room of heaven on a regular basis, and we can minister to each other in the unity of faith, and this is what we're going to do. There's a whole book in the Bible, the book of Psalms, that you can go into that's just all about worship. It's like knowing who God is. It's like a lament often, and then knowing who he is, and then worshiping him because of the truths about who he is, but I won't get into that right now. So to live out unity, to minister to each other, to worship wholeheartedly, to share words with each other and use our gifts, this is what we want to do. So these are the adjustments that we're making at Anchor Point. You re- you ready for this? Yeah. I hope so. Some of you aren't, but that's okay. Okay. So, <laughs> first off, we are going to eliminate coffee break starting in October for the foreseeable future. Come on, Aiden. You're like, what? We feel like what happens is so often we have a time where in worship and song, God is leading us somewhere, and then we have this coffee break that we got to get to, <laughs> and we, everyone's kind of prepared for it. We're like, man, I think this is already back in probably May. We sensed the Lord saying that it was time to bring it to a close, and so we're going we're gonna to bring it to a close because we, we see that there's a lack in some other areas. There's a lack of time to minister. There's a lack of time to like lay hands on. There's a lack of time for communion. There's a lack of time for these things. And we want to bring them in. And again, we don't want to keep nicking heaven and then falling down. We want to enter in. And so what we'll do, the way the service will go is at the beginning, we'll have just a song or a call to worship. And then one of the elders or or one of the staff are going to come up and just lead us. We'll share some of the announcements, get us on the same page, have some of the values that we're, we're trying to share. Just like like kind of a five-minute exhortation to like capture us and ready us for the service. Then we'll enter into worship and we will spend time learning how to get before him. And in that time coming out of it, um, if God wants to speak, we'll have opportunity for, uh, for if there's a word that God is sharing, we'll talk about that. We'll give a, a place where that can happen. It'll probably start off with, with elders and leaders that are doing that, but we want an opportunity for that. We're gonna give opportunity to be prayed over and maybe on a weekend, you come and you need prayer for healing. Like we, we do it sometimes, but we'd actually like to not, again, just like we're going to take 47 seconds to pray for healing. We'd like to have time in which we can pray and we can minister and come alongside. And so coming out of worship, the band will keep playing. And if you need prayer or need to be ministered to or we do communion or prayer for healing, we'll just follow how the Lord is leading for the service. And so, also, does that make sense? You tracking with me? And we want you to be like hungry, but have an opportunity to just be there. Now we can do it in our seats. Uh, we'll, we'll open this up more if we need to. We'll also invite people during worship at the beginning. We'll just invite you like, come to the front. We think that not everyone can clearly, <laughs> but we, we invite people to come and to be up here so that when we're worshiping, like we're you're already bumping each other, but like you're really in, like bumping each other. We want that. You can worship alone at home. You can have worship on, but like there's something about like the people being together in our adoration for him and singing songs to him. And then you begin to minister. Even in the first service, we had some time at the end and it was like someone just came up right away and put their hands on me and uh, praying for me and I'm praying for them. And then God gave me a word and I got a minister right then. And then people just started kneeling and we weren't really inviting. We just, God was beginning to move. It's like, God, we need more of that. People need encounters with you. And so we want to try and provide a way in which there's encounter if he wants to speak and there's healing and there's prayer for you. And so we're going to do that. So 
And then after that, whenever that is, we'll head into a message and we'll still have that going on. And so at any point while we have worship going, if you kneel down uh, or put your hand up, some it'll be more challenging, but if in worship, if you ever put your hand up or, or kneel down, we'll just come alongside. And if someone lays hands on, say, hey, can I pray for you? And you're like, oh, I don't need prayer. It's like, it's okay, just take it. Just get prayer and just get it and it's all good. And we wanna be able to minister to each other. Okay, does that make sense so far? I wanna make sure you're tracking with me. It'll probably take a little bit of time to get used to, but we want to walk down that road. And so that's what the foreseeable future is gonna look like, and it'll start in two weekends. So on the, the October 6th is when we'll start, which is the same time that we also start the third service. So seven o'clock in the evening, no childcare. Okay, so now I wanna talk about small groups real quickly. So small groups is one of those staves that's been pretty low for us. We have groups that are going on. We, I don't know, we probably have 25 groups that are happening in the church, but there's always a need and we're trying to sort it through and times are challenging and all of a sudden it's like Thursday nights never work for anyone and the next time it's like 6 a.m. works and then it doesn't. So we wanna sort through and how do we have groups together? Now, first off, you don't need to be in a group, <laughs> okay? It's not like, ah, uh, if you come to Anchor Point, you need to be in a group, no. But some people really need to be in a group. A place in which you get to know people and they get to know you, where you get to be stretched and pulled and you're challenged to open the word and to share things of what God is teaching you and you learn how to pray and minister to each other. So I often say that we just need a ton of people just to start a group. So I wanna talk about how do you start a group at the church. I'm gonna start off by telling a quick story and then in four minutes I'll have this closed up and probably six, and then the worship team will come up. So how many of you have ever coached a sport before? Put your hands up high because I'm, gonna, I'm just about to enroll you. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, when you coach a sport, uh, my children played, uh, played sports, and, uh, oh, and in the playing of sports, what would happen is we play soccer, and then the team is all formed because everyone registered, and then what happens is like the convener would come up and be like, okay, so right now, you're, every year, your team does not have a coach right now, so if you want your children to play soccer this year, one of you is going to have to coach, right? So I'm always the sucker. I'm like, yeah, love to coach. Love it. Love it. Nothing better to do with my life than to coach like all of my children doing things. And so I get to a, got to a point where I'm like, no, I need to give other people the opportunity. So I just put my hands in my pocket. They're like, who's going to coach? Head down. Like everyone, they look over. And then, of course, this one wonderful, beautiful person that's willing but has never touched a soccer ball ever. It's like, ah, I really want my child to play. I, I guess I could. And we're like, oh yeah, sick, I don't have to do it. And then you go to the first practice and you're like, oh no. <laughs> if my child is gonna enjoy this, if anyone's gonna grow, if the parents are gonna like it, if we want any of these kids to ever play the sport again, you're probably gonna need to help because there's nothing. And so you're like, would you like some help? Yeah, I really would. But there's something so dynamic about like doing this, having responsibility, having to show up somewhere, needing to prepare. It pushes you to grow. It pushes you in a way that wouldn't if you just attend, if you just put your hands in the pockets and that's the end of it. So we probably need a bunch of coaches. Uh, I guess I could. And maybe for some it's really challenging and I get it, but I'm gonna try to help you understand how a group could work. So first off, how do you start a group? Be hungry to start a group or to, to walk in a walk with God. Pray and ask God about a group. Easy, get hungry. Don't, don't start a group if you're not hungry to be in a group. Please don't do that. But if you are, this could be a way that we do it. And, uh, but sometimes it's like, but how do I, will anyone come? What does it look like? I think the best way to do it is you find somebody that you like being with and you go to them and say, do you want to start a group together? It's like, I really need you. It's like, Alan, like, I really want to do a group. I love hanging out with you. Do you want to do a group together? High five. We're in. And we start a group. And if it's just the two of us forever, it's okay. So we have a group. It starts just the two of us. Then if you really want, if you want more people to come to the group, you come to church 30 minutes early and you look for the 455 people that have shown up and you just come early and you meet with people and talk with people and say, oh, are you in a group? No, I'm not. Man, you should come join our group. Alan and I, like, our group rocks and we eat food like a lot. So you should come and you can invite people and it's pretty straightforward if you just come early and look for people to invite. Now, some of you are like, I can't do it. Your personalities don't allow. 
Totally good. Here's another beautiful way. So I can come up, let's say I'll, I'll choose Andre. So I go to Andre and I really like what Andre, what's going on in Andre's life and I want to be in a group, but I'm like, Andre's awesome. So I just want Andre to, to be the leader. I'm like, Andre, I see these gifts in you. I think you lead really well. I think if more people in the church could be around you and learn from you and be discipled by you, that would be really good. So I'm wondering if you would like to start a group, I'll even organize it, but like, would you start or would you lead a group? I'll be the best small group person ever. I'll bring all of the food. I'll, I'll make sure that everyone's well fed, but I think you should start it because you have all these gifts. And then you're like, it's so encouraged. You're like, I guess I have no option. And you just start a group, right? Like you just, it's sort of be, but it's, it's not disingenuous. It's like, sometimes we just don't know and we're insecure and we're fearful and we're not, and someone just needs to come alongside and say, would you consider, have you ever thought of, I would love to be in a group with you. Do you think you could? And I think this is a beautiful way in which it could start. Some of you are way better at just setting the atmosphere and some of you are better at giving leadership. Seldom are people gifted in both of those things where they can set a good atmosphere and they can give good leadership because usually the ones who are leading are not very good with attention to detail and vice versa. What does the group look like? It could be missional. You could have a, a plan on building the kingdom together somehow. You could just do an activity together, just getting believers together. But maybe the main one is to come and to read the word and to study the word and to build into each other. And if you were gonna start a small group, I would suggest that a time together could look like this. Start off with food. Say food. food. How many of you don't like food? Yeah. Like that, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you don't like it, you love it. Ah, saved, yeah. So you don't have to do food, but food is a really good drawing card for sure. Uh, chips and carrots, that's what I say, chips and carrots. And uh, then everyone's happy. If you're gluten-free, you got carrots. Think about that, that sounds amazing. <laughs> All right, that's one. Have some food. Second is, like when you come together, worship God. How do you worship him? Put on a little bit of music and say, we're just gonna sit for 15 minutes and just get our hearts set before God, however, however you need. Just, just detox from the day so you can get ready in which to engage. That'd be one. Two, take turns. Ask everyone in the group. Set up a little schedule. You're gonna lead worship. You'll lead worship. One might lead you in song. One might take you into like James chapter one and say, we're just gonna take 10 minutes and read James one just on your own. Just spend time worship. It could be Thanksgiving. Get into groups of two and we're just gonna thank God for things that are going on. So worship Jesus. And the second one is, out of 1 Corinthians 14, share a word or a psalm or a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. Share something. The idea is that everyone is growing in the things of God. There's something that you're growing in, so come and share with each other what you're growing in. It's like, oh man, and maybe it was just in James 1. And you're like, I don't know, just before when we were worshiping Jesus, I read in James 1 this, and I think this is encouragement for me in the group. Awesome. But you share what's going on. It's not your personal stuff in terms of I'm really struggling with my spouse. It's not like that. It's share a revelation or a psalm or a hint, something that God is doing in your life to encourage the believers that are in the group and then pray for each other. And that's where you can just share the things that are going on. I'm struggling with this and what do you think? And I need some prayer and there's this problem that's going on or we just lost our car. We don't know what to do. And it's like, oh, we have a car. We can take care of. Here's an extra. We'll go like this. And then the body cares for each other. And that could be a small group. Worship him, share a word or a psalm or a hymn, and minister and pray for each other. And that would make a brilliant small group. You got it? Are you guys hot? <laughs> Welcome to Mexico. <laughs> Should have wore shorts or come to the first service where it's like everyone's cold to start. Okay, so worship team, why don't you come on up and... Uh, Church, it's exciting. We're gonna start these changes in two weeks from now. So there's still gonna be coffee, don't worry. And you can stay after for as long as you would like. And we still want you to know each other. And there might be times that we just say we're gonna break and that's cool. But we just want to be able to engage and worship and minister to each other. And so um, that's what we have. So I'm gonna pray. And uh, then the worship team will, will lead us and we'll, we'll end off our service. So Jesus, thank you for today. And God, we see adjustments, I think, in scripture that are important. And God, I think what will happen is as we worship you and as we put our attention on you, 
I think the gift of prophecy might become increasingly clear. Maybe we'll hear with increased clarity as we lay down the burdens of every day, as we put it down, lay it aside, and put our eyes upon you. Jesus, would you help us? God, we want to be a church that lives out and obeys your word. Help us to do that, Jesus. I don't want us to get weird. I just want us to be so on fire for you, so passionate about serving you and worshiping you and knowing you. Thank you, God, for the different people that you brought to the church and the different gifts and even the building here, Jesus. We don't, we don't quite know how the money comes. That's okay. Jesus, we ask that you would work in us and provide and help us to just have faith and believe in you. God, thank you that we have the prayer room set up throughout the week and we can come for long periods of time for someone to lead us into your presence. We can sit before you. God, we're in such a culture that just rips all over the place and we watch all these videos all the time and God, we need to learn how to settle, become still, adore you, get our eyes into heaven. Thank you, God, for this morning. Amen.